The following program is a presentation of BaseNet Internet Television. This is Holly Hurley, and I'm welcoming you to this week's Crashing Glass podcast, which I believe we're calling Technically Chicks. <laughs> um, not in, not a, there's a comma in there, uh, so you know, not, not that we're saying we are Technically Chicks, but that these chicks are very technical, um, and I thought that was hilarious and double entendre E. I I hope that's okay with you girls. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, we, we are Technically Chicks. <laughs> And this week we have some uh, super stunners with us. So obviously uh, Jill Henley's with me uh, at Per Huge from Massachusetts. Hi, Jill. Hi, everyone. And we have two very special techie guests this week. We've got um, number one, Miss Kate Hutchinson from United Domains. Hi, Kate. Hi. And, uh, and Kate, you're the, the COO over there. Is that what I hear? Marketing manager and COO. <laughs> I, I, my technical title is marketing manager, but I do all the on, on the ground management for the company, so I function as a COO. Wow! So no rest for the weary then on that front, basically. <laughs> no. Like two very big hats. Yes. Excellent. And then, uh, and then, of course, we have Marissa Levy Lair or Marissa Levy, depending, uh, I think, on which site we're talking about, uh, with us from <laughs> 52cakes.com. And uh, and Marissa, tell us a little bit about yourself. Oh, um, I'm a web developer and um, all-around tech nerd and musician and cake decorator and dog owner. And uh, Holly and I went to college together. <laughs> and, and she lived with her. me. She oh, lived with me. She still wants to be my friend, which if you've ever lived with me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that, those college roommates, that's, you're right, that's a bond that... That's like that. What what happens in your college dorm or your college apartment stays there, right? And <laughs> <laughs> well, I had a really exceptional experience. You go ahead. <laughs> yeah, we technically didn't live together until after college, but uh, second semester of freshman year, we both had single dorm rooms because <laughs> neither of our roommates <laughs> wanted to live with us anymore. <laughs> So we, we had mine had a nervous breakdown and yours was just really weird I think but <laughs> yeah no she was not so, they, not 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 a winner but uh, yeah no that was really interesting but we we got lonely so sometimes we would like have sleepovers that's <laughs> <laughs> true well, I wanted to just mention that Marissa not only is she a techie but as she mentioned she's a musician and artist right and yeah, behind our podcast. Right, and so our, our logo theme music, and our theme song, our logo right. for the Crash and Glass podcast, as well as our our intro and um, you know exit music, Breathing Fire, both were done by Marissa. So we're she, you are so well rounded. You're. I like to have my hands on lots of things. <laughs> oh, that's great. Very creative. Thanks. Very awesome. So obviously we brought you two girls in because um, we are discussing this week basically women who get into the tech the tech industry in different capacities. And there was actually what sparked this for Jill and I was there was an article on NPR a while back. It was actually earlier this year in January. And uh, they basically were talking with three female uh, founders of startups for online companies. It was uh, Deborah Jackson, Kelly Hoey, and Veronica Sansbev. And, uh, and they did, they've done all kinds of interesting tech projects, uh, Women Innovate Mobile and other things. And, and basically they were asking them, why don't more women get into this industry? You know, when you look at the industry, you see Mark Zuckerberg, you see the guys from Google, you never see women. And we were really curious as to why that happened. So obviously, you know, knowing that both of you have been very self-starting and very uh, self-sustaining in this industry and very successful, I think, as far as internet terms are concerned. Basically, we just wanted to kind of talk to you guys about why you think that happens, or if you think it happens. I I do want to interject just somewhat, like, well, first of all, I found found the article, like, weirdly offensive, even though it's like, even the whole thing is like, why, why aren't there more women in tech? Like, there should be. But I sort of felt like, why are we even talking about this? Like, this should be a non-starter. And, you know, like, in a weird way, I'm glad they're talking about it, but I just sort of felt like... Yeah, I mean, women should be CEOs of tech companies, and I don't understand why this is an article. But anyway, really quickly, I just wanted to mention, I mean, there are a couple of women sort of superstars in the tech world, and, you know, I I would be remiss to not talk about them at all. Like, 
like Marissa Mayer from Google or Meg Whitman, who is uh, who is uh, CEO of eBay. Like there are there and are Carly women Fiorina out there. of HP. Right. So so you know, I mean, to say that there are no women, you know, out there is is totally a fallacy, obviously. And we we know that we're all you know we all acknowledge that. But why aren't there more? And I just thought, like, some of the things that they were talking about in the article, like, don't be shy. You know, I was like, really? Like, I don't know any women who are shy that have ambitions to be CEOs. Like, you know, I just, I found it a little bit odd. Well, it seems like it was talking mostly, though, about well, the idea of startups and that, the you know, I, I kind of, I, what I liked is that how they said, you know, investors are missing some opportunities because they're, you know, they're, they're looking for a white guy in a hoodie. Right. And I just like the Zuckerberg, you know, the Zuckerberg, uh, what am I trying to say? Um, stereotype. Stereotype. Thank you, Holly. Yeah, they're looking for the boys in the garage. The and, boys, yes. Yeah. Right. And the stereotype. And so now, you know, maybe they're not broadening, now, you know, broadening their vision to look outward. And so I guess, well, because you, it seems like the women that you just mentioned that are CEOs of major tech companies, but they came, that's different than a woman, you know, doing a startup, right? Well, I would say that when you talk about startups and women, if you look at what men bring to the table as startups, what they're looking at is often things that are technology-based, that that's the core of it. It's not technology as a distribution, et cetera. So men are using technology skills, their coding skills to say, hey, I'm going to build this tech company and I'm going to build it from the ground up. And that's what people are looking for. That's what VCs are used to seeing. But there are plenty of women who have great ideas about well, here, I will give you my secret idea that really I just hope someone actually builds it because I don't have the time to start a company. But I'd love to see something like an iPad that you could hang on a wall that would sync your calendars with all your Blackberries, Androids, etc. So your entire family could have a calendar on the wall. So you see, that's a great idea. But I'm not going to code that from the ground up or engineer it. You know, I think, I think men have that idea where women tend to have the idea but don't often have the same skill set. So I think a lot of them are discouraged that they have to find a guy with the skill set and aren't necessarily looking to themselves to say, I could do this. I mean, if I really wanted to, I could go back and learn how to code an engineer or find someone to teach me and build this great product. But, you know, that's not my potential. That's not my interest. So, Well, speaking as a female developer, <laughs> I mean, it is true there are not a lot of us around but there are more and more you know as which is I, great yeah and you know in new york here there's girl develop it it's a meetup group for you know women who want to learn how to program and you know i think to say that women have the ideas and then don't have the know-how you know to actually build is not necessarily true i mean i know for me why I'm not like doing startups every other day is I don't really have time. Mm-hmm. And but I think you know, that's actually kind of a women's issue anyway. Totally. If I totally you think, think about it's a women's issue. You know, I I think that's more what I meant to say, not that they don't have the gumption. It's that they, you know, when you look at what your average woman is looking at, that they are generally the primary caregiver for any children in the family, often for elderly parents now, that they're usually the one who makes dinner. Who, who make dinner, who do the laundry, who, you know, pick up the dry cleaning. Um, yeah, and by the way, my husband is just making noises at me right now to point out <laughs> that he's the one who does the majority of the cooking, cleaning, laundry in my uh, house. I'm happy but, to oh. do that because my husband is actually running a load of laundry, the dishwasher. Oh, oh, okay. I, right now. So, so there are good husbands out there. But... Um, <laughs> For the majority of women, um, you're looking at the men work late and they're expected to do the, the bulk of the, the pickup work. And when you add housework and child care on top of your job that you're probably working anyway, there's not a lot of time left over to pick up JavaScript and CSS. Hey, I have a great point that my, hus- my husband made um, recently, and that is that so you're right. Like, it's so funny that here we are saying that women do all the household stuff and that yet the husband's right at this very moment are doing laundry. <laughs> how, how much uh, irony can we have here? But, um, and my husband does a ton of household chores, in, you know, definitely. However, he recently, just a, you know, a couple months ago, he 
he paused it. He was, you know, talking about something about the whole family or the calendar or something. And he said, you know, you're the CEO of this family. He's like, I'm just the low. He said, I'm just the lowly CFO <laughs> because he does do the bill paying. But he was cute because he's like, you're the CEO and, you know, I'm the lowly CFO. Because when you're mentioning all these different chores that, you know, that obviously your husbands are sharing and so is mine. However, it's, we're still running this, when you're running the household, that involves a lot of emotional energy when you are, you know, whether there's kids or not, but in the, no matter what ages of the kids, you're sort of, it's like this idea of a CEO. I mean, you may not be hands-on every single thing, but you are managing all of that has to happen and you have the deadlines and you know, and that's really like, I think what, what you're getting at here is that women are these the CEOs of their families and then how much of time do they have left over? And that's coming from someone here that I only work part-time, you know, at this point. Mm-hmm. I, know, I, I think that's a huge part of it. And when you ask about why aren't women doing startups, a startup is an incredible investment in time. My office is, it's a subsidiary, but it functions like a startup. And I work very long hours. I, you know, I'm on deck for, did this bill get paid? Um, Suddenly someone's sending us a question about, can we offer this feature? Can we do this? Can we do that? And, oh, what do I think about this? And legal notices. And, you know, at at some point uh, last month, I was heavily in the middle of planning a new marketing campaign. And my boss said, hey, who paid our taxes last year? Can you figure that out and find me someone to do it and so you know the the idea that that women or anyone really has the time to invest in a startup it, it's a huge investment and I think the point that you make about running a household being a, a an emotional investment it's emotionally draining to work so much and to have to do so much for yourself so I think that may be one reason why women tend to shy away from it because there's not that necessarily enough support in place to help them carry that size of a workload well, I think it's interesting uh, that the way that you phrase that, Kate, too, because, you know, in business school, one of the things we're constantly talking about is this very issue because, you know, startups can be internet companies, but they can really be any company, you know, an oh, entrepreneur, sure. you know, can come in any industry. And one of the big, uh, I'm a really active in the um, uh, the Women's MBA Association, mm-hmm. and a big part of my interest is this very thing of, you know, when I worked in production, I had to be really entrepreneurial. I had to do everything for myself. I had to create something out of nothing and I was the same way like my boss would be like hey you know I think we have a gas leak can you figure out who to call for that and then I'm also hiring a hundred people and firing them and you're like yeah well I'm everything and we Mm -hmm. talked about actually a lot in the women's MBA association that one of the things is women never see themselves as as like I find this that we've all talked about this happening in our group work too we don't see ourselves sometimes as the final opinion on whatever it is. We're always like, you know, like you said, like we want support for something. And with women, we're constantly looking to do something as like a team effort. We'll say, well, I'll get on board with your project. We support each other. And a lot of times I think men go, well, this is my company. And even if like I've supported, I've, you know, I helped my friends start this, uh, this organization in New York, this big production company. And I remember, you know, one of the guys saying, well, this is my creation. Or like two of the guys said, well, this is me and him. And I was like, hey, guys, remember that I set up everything? Yeah. You know, it's like, it's not our, we would say it's our company. I think a lot of times dudes just go, this is my company. Yeah, I, consensus. I, women women look for consensus more, would you say? Yeah, we want to have a team. You know, yeah. like, I'd never say this is my show. I'd be like, oh, this is Jill and my show. This is our show. This is, you know, Ed, you know, Ed records it. So for us, it's like, this is Basenet's show. You right. know, we would never say, I'd never be like, listen to my show. You know, right. I created this show. I'm COO of Crashing Glass. So I'd never say that. <laughs> It's not true, you know. I I think that's actually kind of part of the problem. I I mean I mean, I the projects that I do with the team, if I'm truly the leader of it, I'm gonna try to take that credit. I th- I think. I think um, you should. Yeah. I I I guess we tend to be a, a little bit more humble, you know, when we're when we're working, but um. Yeah, I mean, maybe it is an ego thing. Women's egos tend to not quite be as, you know, big. And we're always trying to be polite and, you know, m- put everyone's needs ahead of ours and stuff like that. But I think maybe, I, maybe that's the issue, you know. Maybe it's we have to put ourselves first. 
I, I completely agree with that in that a lot of times, um, I mean, the, the idea of being nice and sharing is something that uh, girls are taught from the very beginning. Um, you know, who isn't, I can remember being a very, very boisterous little girl and I was always told to be quiet and <laughs> be nice to everyone. And, you know, I can remember things like, you know, I would create a big art project. And I'd say, this is my project. And, well, my sister had made one too. And, well, it's your, your, you did it together. And, you know, I think there's a lot of socializing that goes on from a very young age to say, girls shouldn't take credit for their work. It's, it's a group thing. And that once you learn that at such a young age, it is really difficult to drop to say, yes, I'm going to be noisy and loud. And no, I'm not going to listen if you tell me to be quiet. Boy, ladies. Yeah. Oh, sorry. No, go ahead. I, I have I have a book for you guys to read at some <laughs> point. Just about not you know not playing small. And if tell us the title. It's called Mama Gina's School for the Womenly Arts or Mama Gina's Guide to the Womenly Arts. It's a ah. pink book. She's got pink feather boas on. And anyway, there's a lot there's a lot about a lot more in it. But um, one of the basic things is to stop playing small. You know, because uh, Mama Gina created an empire on this theory, right? I mean, she's sort of the empire of becoming the big woman in charge, right? Um, yeah, I, you know, I mean, she she started the school with her husband, I guess, but um, you know, um, she she's doing it pretty much all women now. So yeah, I, I mean, there's definitely nothing small about that woman. She's uh, <laughs> large and in charge and has a mouth on her like a sailor and you know she she captivates a room for sure but anyway I mean you know not that she is the model for what a CEO a female CEO should look like um, but I just think that to stop apologizing for who we mm -hmm. are and mm -hmm. to just start acknowledging that we're awesome you know mm -hmm. and that certainly is going to help and but, you know, I think the issue is not so much like, you know, we're all, I don't know, in our late 20s, early 30s, that kind of thing. Like, not that we're hopeless. We're totally, there's there's hope for us. But <laughs> really what who we should be getting to is, is the 18-year-olds and the girls who are entering college and choosing not to be computer science majors or, you know, not to be, like, maybe they're communications majors, but their grand ambition is to, like, you know, work their little marketing job for the rest of their life or something. Like, those are the women that we need to get to. I and would say that we need to get to the girls that are in kindergarten. Well, that's <laughs> your great. You're absolutely right. Yeah. Well, because we, and I say that because I have a, you know, I have, that's, I have two kids and I have one of each, one boy, one girl, and the girl's in kindergarten. And, and I feel like it's, well, it's just that's where that's where it's got to start, you know. Or I mean, obviously even before that, but in public wise, it's 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 kindergarten's the first year of public school. And um, I now I'm not in my late twenties, early thirties. I'm about ten years older than you guys, and I just it's so so I have a little bit you know of that different perspective because of my own future. Because yeah, well, so what what am I going to do? What, now that I'm going back to work. Um, so it's so interesting to hear that you say, you know, you guys aren't certainly have so much that you can in front of you, but not as much as the 18 year olds. And then, uh, then you think about the six year old <laughs> and really whenever we talk, uh, no matter what show, you know, we seem to do with the crashing glass, it does come back to the, the whole point of, you know, that this idea of breaking through barriers and I want to say that a lot of times or I want to throw this out to our guests and to Holly what about why do we try to do it like the man like Zuckerberg or to why women are gonna it's gonna look different when they do it right we're gonna it's gonna look different and it's our way or it, it's not gonna be exactly the same way a man would do it I, I, I'll take a part of this one. I think uh, that's one of the reasons why I'm glad people are starting to talk about Margaret Thatcher again. Because I think it should look like whatever you want it to look like. I'm not going to be a white guy in a hoodie. That's not what I'm going to look like going where I'm going to go. I'm going to dress the way I dress. I'm going to speak the way I speak. And you don't expect Zuckerberg to look like Steve Jobs. You don't want him to look like Steve Jobs. And I think every individual, every person who's building something should be able to get their 
as they are. And that that's something I struggle with. I remembered I used to think that to have success in an industry, you have to look like what people think you're supposed to look like. And I've even tried to find ways, obviously, within being professionally appropriate to really express myself as a woman and also as a, as a person with an artistic viewpoint, because I think it's important to be who you are in whatever space you're in. You can't take the traditional route or else you're just going to be like everyone else. You're not going to change anything. Well, I think one thing that's important to keep in mind is also what images we're showing this younger generation as they grow up. When you think about what what do we show boys and girls now about, say, a future in tech, boys are seeing really awesome video games. They're seeing really cool things. And... You know, girls are seeing Legos redesigned for them to have, build shopping malls that are pink. Um, <laughs> there's a huge message that we send to kids about when they grow up, what does their future look like? And for girls, we tell them, your future is pink, and it wears a skirt and cute shoes, and it doesn't fly spaceships. And I... <laughs> I, I, I sort of worry about kids growing up like that. I do a pen pal mentorship program for kids in middle school here in Boston, and the boys almost always have written to me that they want to grow up and be video game designers. They want a career in tech. They've seen something cool, and they want to do that for themselves. And when I look at girls, they're, you know, they're seeing Disney princesses everywhere. And none of those Disney princesses has, um, you know, solved a problem about clean water or done something that can actually be transformed into a career, which it makes me concerned. I, I remember back to my childhood, and honestly, my Barbie dolls were always CEOs or private investigators, but I don't see a lot of those coming well, you know, out. I just yeah. recently bought many, many, many uh, boxes of uh, the I Can Be Barbie and she's a oh. computer programmer. <laughs> oh, yes. I, I was very excited about that. And she comes with like glasses and sensible shoes. <laughs> that's my yeah. favorite. That she's like basically wearing Crocs. I just think that's hilarious. <laughs> um, <laughs> I do wish she was a brunette though. Not a uh, lot of blonde computer programmer. Yeah, Barbie yeah. Types. You know, that's the thing is you make a step forward. I, I have to admit, I am a huge Barbie fan despite <laughs> my longstanding feminism. Um, is that when you look at the ones that, you know, like glitter and glam Barbie or whatever, they make a whole line of them and they make the, the Barbie and the brunette and the red-haired and the Asian and all the diverse types. But when they come out with something like I can be Barbie, she has to be just the one. And she does one thing, and that's it. And that honestly doesn't have a lot of appeal because she can't sort of move around and interact with her other computer programming friends. But I, I applaud it's a step in the right direction, but I still feel it's a stunted message to kids. I wonder if this is, you know, this idea of the socializing girls, you, know, you just wonder how much is it, 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 it always, for me, things always go back to the nature versus nurture argument. And how much of this is part of our nature or you know and how like we were saying we are team builders consensus builders um the the art the npr um article that we referenced at the beginning of the show has a great quote from veronica sansev who is founders of women innovate mobile um which is um it gives out money for women who want to do startups. It gives them, you know, mentoring, money, actual money, and, and some training. And she says um, that the research indicates that women overall just have this different I, this different confidence when a woman gets a C in calculus. You know, whether high school, college, she gets a C, uh, she may figure, well, I'm not that good at math. Maybe I shouldn't go into computer science in college. Um, or, or study, you know, I'm going to stick with communications, as someone just mentioned. But that's not so for the guy. A young man who gets that same grade thinks, oh, that's I'm a math whiz. That's great. I'm going to stay on this track. I'm going to major in computer science. And I have seen that. I have seen men. I feel like it almost goes back to the idea of body image, where a man who's fit 40 pounds overweight would look in the mirror and say, I look awesome. I'm so sexy. I, and they do. They think that sometimes. They think they look great. And a woman who's 10 pounds overweight looks in the mirror and is just like, oh my gosh, I, there's so many imperfections that I have. So I wanted to throw that out to you guys. Well, I, I mean, I don't know about the, the men thing because I the man in my life is very body conscious and I know I think <laughs> Francis' husband's very Mine similar. Too. <laughs> 
but the uh, but the part about the math I can say is honestly true because I am in I'm in finance classes now and I was not good at math as a kid. Of course, for me, not good at math means something different. Like because I was like a straight A student, and sometimes I got like C pluses in math. You know, mm-hmm. so then when it came down to like getting in, getting into grad school now, and I I haven't taken math in like 16 years, and some of these people are fresh out of undergrad, you know, or like fresh off of finance jobs, and it amazes me in my finance class. Like he'll ask a really basic question about what the data is telling us. Like maybe I'm not the one who sits down and makes the spreadsheets, but I can tell you what it what the data is telling us like very clearly 90 percent of the time, and I'm just like. You know, it'll be a stupid question about MPV, and half the guys in the class will be like, they don't, they don't understand it. And a lot of them are going into finance. Mm-hmm. And it's the same thing where they'll be like, well, we just have to pass. And I'll be like, but don't you want to understand what's happening in here? Like, you don't want to just run data. You need to understand what it's telling you, or else you're going to counsel people to make some really stupid investment decisions. <laughs> <laughs> well, Yeah, well, it blew my mind, actually. I was shocked because I honestly thought I was terrible, terrible, terrible at math. And the longer I'm in school, the more I'm like, nope. <laughs> no, the other people. Everyone else was just better at faking it. Yeah. Well, you know, it's funny that the only co- the only classes in high school that I ever got um, a C in was physics and geometry. And as a Flash developer, I did do a lot of, like, Flash action scripting work. 99% of the stuff that I'm doing is, like, making things move and animate. And what is that? Flash. Physics. Or is, is, <laughs> is geometry and physics. <laughs> and I just think that's really funny that I just kind of fell into it that way. Um, but it never even occurred to me that, like, I was doing I was doing math. So I think, Holly, with you, the, what you're talking about is your ability to practically um, apply the math is probably greater than a lot of the other people in your class. Like maybe their like math skills might be better, but they at the end of the day don't know how to translate that into, you know, real life. I think I think it's highly probable. But I think a lot of it had to do with my confidence level too. It took me coming sure. to school and getting into the program to be able to say, I, I know what this means or to have someone call on me when I thought I didn't know and then find out that I did for me to go, Oh, I, I know what this means. I know this. I, I didn't think I knew this. I know this, you know? It's so weird. I hate the fact that I needed like I needed some something to tell me that, you know, that I couldn't just know. Well, it it's also I think there's a a gender dynamic at work in any classroom. I also have an MBA and I did it at Simmons, which is an all women's program. And I too had struggled with math in the past. I I knew what my handicap was. It was actually basic arithmetic. So um, now I, we found this out my senior year of high school when I got A's in calculus because I finally had a teacher who was like, well, you get the concepts. You're not always doing the math right, but you, you've got that. So, you know, working from there, she helped me a lot. But when I got to, you know, business statistics and accounting and financial reporting and all of that, working in a classroom with just women and finding that we were all being very supportive of learning and finding something out together, that was hugely instructive for me, working in groups, being able to rely on my classmates to help me when I was really frustrated. And now... I'm a super whiz with math, and I can do all kinds of accounting and forecasting and financial productions. But I don't think if I'd done my MBA in a co-ed classroom, I would have been able to pick it up as easily. Because in co-ed classrooms, I tend to be super competitive, and I don't want to learn from guys because they're guys. They're looking down at me because I'm a woman, and I'm going to show them I'm better. That's so it all goes back to confidence. Like it all goes back to confidence when we're raising girls. I, I think it really, really does. And um, I mean, but I, I don't think you should, you know, try to say that you know girls who aren't being confident, you know, aren't living up to their potential. I mean, not everybody, male or female, is comfortable, you know, doing a startup or doing something that requires that mass amount of confidence. I, I guess getting back to what Marissa was saying about being a little insulted about the article is that, you know. It is kind of insulting saying, why aren't you running a startup? You really should when you might not want to. But at the same time, I think there's something that maybe wasn't phrased as well in that article that I I think a lot of times women aren't given the support to go and push for that. 
I, you know, I think you're right. I think it's sort of double-sided on that. And I do think it's, it's interesting for me because one of the things I learned having to be really entrepreneurial, I didn't actually like creating stuff from the ground up. I was like, it takes so much effort for very little payoff. And I'm kind of risk averse. And I actually really enjoy the, sh- I enjoy structure. I enjoy being a cheerleader. I enjoy being, and, and I know, I know that that limits my earning potential to a certain extent, but I also know what sort of things I'm willing. I think you need to have something that you're so passionate about creating that it's willing to take that big risk. Mm -hmm. You know, whereas I don't think that every situation or every startup or every incremental innovation is really worth the time and the effort a startup takes, you know. And I think sometimes people don't weigh the cost versus benefit for them in their personal life, you know, or in their professional life. Because for me, sometimes it wasn't probably the most profitable track. Mm-hmm. I don't know. Is everybody there? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I was just reading some of the, the comments and stuff from this, this NPR article. And one woman wrote in and, you know, kind of got at what we've already brought up, which is she's amazed that the model... The model that, let's say, women innovate mobile, that, you know, that model of used is similar to those already in place. You know, we'll give you money. We'll give you office space and mentoring. But those models haven't attracted women so far. So why w- why should we believe that women using that same model will have a different outcome? You know, it's like why it seems like uh, it's not, it might not be working that way. And, and what are we going to do to, attra- how, you know, what can people do to, to change that? Well, I think there's also the point of what are women trying to create as startups and, you know, going into why doesn't venture capital fund women, oftentimes when you look at the marketplace in general, men are the default consumer. I'm selling this to men and, oh, if I want something for women, it has to be different. If you look at startup communities like the Ladies Who Launch site, the product that those women come up with, they're great products, but they're often almost exclusively limited to women's use. They're, Mm. you know, different kinds of ways to make your high heels more comfortable. They're different takes on a nursing bra. They're whatever it is, it's pink, and men are not going to want to buy it, Um, which is unfortunate because pink is a great color and a lot of men look good in it. But uh, I, I think there is this problem that when you end up with venture capital, um, women feel compelled to mark women's products as being pink and for women and because women are consumer a lot of venture capitalists I think walk away and say well that's just for women men aren't going to want to buy this think think of think of uh, those droid phone ads when they first came out we're not the princess phone we're the droid doing data crunching you know <laughs> phone and it was so it was pitched like you know this was a a wrestler not a telephone and (laughs) the idea that women would want this phone no no no. this was a phone for the men this even though women buy lots of cell phones and there 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 is this perception that if you come up with a new product it has to be for men for it to be you know viable in the marketplace that you know there's women's things that are pink and then there are men's things and those are actually forever I thought that was another interesting thing about the article, too, is they mentioned, you know, like, mommy apps, you know, like, Mm -hmm. organizing your grocery list or whatever, you know, on a phone, and, like, why aren't women, you know, spearheading these apps and whatever, but I I had the same kind of reaction, like, well, why does it have to be a mommy-centered app? Why can't it just be a universal app for all genders or, you know, moms and dads or like, well, you know, I just feel like it just pigeonholes women again, you know, which, which is sort of why I go back to like, you know, the girls in college, because they're not really focused on sort of the mommy household stuff. And yeah. so, you know, if they can be inspired yeah. early on uh, to come out, out with ideas that are less sort of in the female-centered box, then, you know, maybe there's hope. (laughs) Yeah, I think that's a a great point. I mean, I really do about going back to the 18-year-olds. And I I would love to know figures on how many girls right now major in communications versus, like, you know, just picking on, not to pick on the communications major, but something very, you know, kind of fluffy, generic versus computer science and and. And how and what the, num- 
Yeah, what the numbers are for the boys, for the men, yeah. But you can also point out when you're approaching these women that studying computer science is a great way to get yourself a job in later life. Everybody is concerned about employability at this point, being in a recession. And, you know, my undergrad degree is in history. My first master's is in education. And then I got a real degree in MBA. But (laughs) if I could go back and study engineering and save myself... 10 years of sort of wandering in the wilderness, that would be fantastic. I, I think that it should be pointed out to women, not that they should be getting computer engineering degrees because, you know, we need more women there, but it's a valid skill set. I'm currently, you know, in the last year I've hired a couple of developing positions. It's ridiculously impossible to find, you know, the best candidate and, you know, hope it's a woman. You get so few women who apply. And, you know, if you can show me you've got the really good skills and the dedication, I'd love to hire you. Yeah, you know, but the, the computer science degrees are not necessary. I mean, I was a music major, and I kind of fell into the sort of development world. Although I do have a lot of regrets that I didn't take more computer science classes, but I had no idea that I would end up doing what I'm doing. I assumed I would have my little music teaching job and I, you know, I'd be hanging out with kids and then playing gigs on the side. But, um, I mean, I'm happy where I, I'm very happy I didn't end up teaching, but, you know, I, I think it's, it's not necessary. I just think that we have to get women interested. You know, they can have their communications degrees and then they come out more well-rounded. And I think that that could play into a strength, you know, if a woman is interested in technology but has the know-how of a communications degree or something a little bit more generic, then they come out and they're not only the doers, but they're also the thinkers. I'm on the list. Oh, go ahead, Holly. No, I think that's an important part of execution, too. And I think that's one of the reasons why I actually did come back to get my MBA is I realized that a lot of the skills that I wasn't, that I was underutilizing in my career, I mean, simple things that you read about in Glamour magazine, for God's sakes, all the time, I actually just didn't have those skills, like the skill set of like negotiating for more money and, and standing up for myself. And, you know, these were things I wanted some practice on, but also I wanted to know how to read all the spreadsheets. I wanted to know how to read all the numbers. I never wanted to be bamboozled by something that might be happening in an industry that I was interested in or in a company I was running. And I think knowing more, you know, I also said when I majored in music also that, you know, I couldn't play piano well. And had I stuck with piano lessons, that would have been a technical skill I would have been better at. You know, and I would have been a better musician because I would have been able to practice by myself. <laughs> I would have had to, like, hire people to play piano for me every time I needed one played, you know. Mm. And I think, I think execution is an important part of actually getting something done. And I think that is something that could be counseled, although I don't know that I would have listened at 18, at least not from my parents. <laughs> What? It's falling apart. <laughs> no. I'm on the ladies who launch what the ladies who launch website. I've never been to this website before and it is fascinating. <laughs> Just in other words, I, it's there's so there's so many so here's these entrepreneurs, you know, maybe entrepreneurs in, in quotes, you know, but they have started their own businesses. But so many of them are, you know, mommy kind of things or have to do with the, you know, uh, cosmetics or um, things like that. Not all of them, you know, it's a mix, but it's just interesting. Um, but the bulk, sort of, bulk like, of them are. Scrapbooky, like Etsy uh, store type, or life coaching. God, I hate life oh, coaching. Oh, the life coaching, yeah. <laughs> That's what it's like. That's a killer. Well, I, I like what you said. I think, Marissa, it was you that said about women starting to think more, you, about being thinkers as well as doers, is that how you put it? Yeah. Um, and like, that's a really great point. And again, it it brings us back, I think, to socializing girls. You know, whether the, whether they're little girls or they're big girls that are going to college, it's just such a it's such a fascinating topic. Mm. I, I think it I think it's a really interesting topic, and I think actually this is a we might move into a precursor to a good, bad, or indifferent here. Yes. Uh, and I love I love that Kate uh, brought something up uh, when we were preparing for the show today about someone by the name of Penelope Trunk, and as we've been watching, and I hate to send people to her side, Kate, after what we talked about, but (laughs) she wrote an article on this very topic called Investors Fund Mostly Men, which is fine for women. 
and uh, and I think she she's an interesting personality. Actually, I'll let I'll let Kate talk a little bit more about her. But I, I was reading the article like obsessively as we were talking about this, and I also have read the Four Hour Work Week, and I read an article she wrote about the guy who wrote that. I mean, just endlessly fascinating, like uh, super biased. I would say writings just to her own personal, like spewing her own personal opinion. This woman has made an empire. Has she? I mean, she's mm-hmm. wildly successful. Yeah. She is. She's very successful. She um, has written books. She's started, I think, three startups. She's on her third, I believe, selling organic goat cheese now. (laughs) Don't quote me on that, but you can read her blog and find out more. She is diagnosed with Asperger's. She has two sons who also have Asperger's, and she is... You know, she her her book is all about career advice for people, and honestly, all she talks about is what vast applies to her. And I think she does a great job of running her own life. I don't think a lot of her advice can be applied outside to other people who are not, because she works in such an open structure of life. I don't think for the rest of us who sort of spend most of our days occupied by you know paying bills and, you know, moving up the ladder and so forth, it it would be very difficult to apply a lot of what she says there. Her name is, just so if anyone listening would want to check, it's Penelope Trunk, which is T-R-U-N-K, and she has a blog, and um, she, from what I understand about her, just basically from uh, Marissa and Kate and Holly, is that she's very, uh, very polarizing to Mm -hmm. her women. Like, she's the Sarah Palin of the tech world. (laughs) (laughs) So it might be worth it just for interest to check it out because she does. She feels she kind of takes the stand, the stand like her her most re- the blog I guess the one that we're talking about from she wrote just this uh, month ago was stop telling women to do startups. Right, <laughs> right. Basically, uh, the argument of the piece is that it's stupid to tell women to start startups because they actually only want to um, have kids. This is really not based on any. It's based on what I would call trend statistics every once in a while. A trend, I'm making quotey fingers, you can't see it. Um, It comes around and and it becomes popular and people will quote out a couple of statistics that sort of support it and, you know, it it was like how every 10 years the New York Times comes out with an article that says college women are choosing to get married and not have careers and it's not really supported by anything, but um, sure, you can find one or two Yale grads who would rather get married than do something and great for them but it's not not necessarily the overarching um real trend it's just trendy to write about it and so she says that in in her piece um from december 11th that you know women are choosing children over startups and they're making these decisions for themselves and that's fine and that's great and we don't need to have them in startups there's enough men to do this anyway (laughs) <laughs> well, you know, she does bring something. There's one section she does, that's true, and she does kind of take this stand, like, almost kind of a, you know, make, kind of putting up a block, you know, almost like a psychological block, like, well, you know, they don't, right, leave them alone, leave women alone, we don't have to push them. But she says in here, you know, she says, men and women are different. So what? You know, so, in other words, like what we we're getting at, that maybe women aren't, it, it doesn't mean they're going to do it the same way that men are, men are already doing it. I, I don't think that we're going to do it the way that men are doing it. And I, I think it's interesting because she, she says she is she is actually a fascinating writer. Um, yeah. I, I don't know if I want to get into the. She also has a really controversial article, article on domestic abuse. But, like, the, it's interesting because she talks about this as being, like, liberating. Hmm. But I don't believe... I believe that it is sort of the op. I think she's almost Hitler-esque in that she's very dangerous because she makes it sound very liberating to not try to do the things that you want to do because she says, well, maybe you want to have kids instead or something or, like, maybe you're not going to be happy. But the problem is, is that's not everybody. You know, like, for me, I don't want to right now, and that should also be okay, you know? Like I think, I, I think it needs to be a choice in order for it to be real liberation. And I wonder, you know, grouping all women into a certain category, she actually says, like, she, she cites some re- research and she actually used the word women would rather stay at home and have a part-time job than either work full-time or stay at home with the kids full-time. 
And I'm like, that's not all women. I do know some women who've been very happy doing that. But that's not all women. Uh, mm. I personally would love to stay home part-time, but it has nothing to do with staying home and raising kids. Yeah. <laughs> I just want to work less. I guess we'll get a, a good batter and different on Penelope Trunk, and maybe we could do one, I don't know, maybe on Whitney Houston or something, you know, just to stick with the news. So this is our Chick uh, News, right? Our, our version of Chick News this week? Yeah, yeah. So we're so I guess we'll do good our two good, bad, and indifference than chick news. Sorry guys, I went on a couple of topics there, I guess. <laughs> That's okay. All right, so let's go Penelope Trunk first. Good, bad, and different. Let's start with Marissa. Oh, um kinda indifferent. I mean, if she wants to spout that kind of poison that's fine. I think it just, you know, it actually just opens up the conversation. Maybe she's playing devil's advocate. Who knows? Cool. I, I'm going to, I feel a little bad because she did actually at one point give me some help with my blog when she put it on Brazen Careers back in the day. But I, this particular position I say is bad. It tells women that because most women that are heard from say, you know, according to this particular one study that I've cited, you know, because they say that you're going to stay home and have kids, you know, don't worry about the startup world, men will take care of it. And I think this is a dismissive attitude that it's very discouraging. When women look at women in the media and they see over and over again that women's issues are relegated to their to the style section of the New York Times or to magazines like Glamour and Cosmo and, you know, that they are the alternate to any serious business news or real news, it, it's a bad thing. It, it doesn't encourage the next generation. It doesn't, you know, make you want to get up and fight for something that you're passionate about. It says, nope, this is how it's always been, and you know what? Keep going with it. How about you, Jill? Well, um, I'm going to be devil's advocate. <laughs> I'm going to say, I'm going to say that I, you know, I've only read one of her blogs so far, but I'm going to say that in some ways she could be good. And with this, with this uh, caveat, with this asterisk, that she's not her audience. From what I can see here, is not. Uh, for young girls, you know, that or girls in college or girls just graduating and thinking about the next step. She's coming at this from, like you were, said earlier, Kate, that she's a Gen Xer, so she's around 40. She's probably, got, she's got, you know, two kids of her own. She, oh, you said she has two boys. Mm -hmm. um, and she's coming at this like, okay, we, everyone, we've got choices to make, and it's okay, it's okay to make the choice to be part-time. You don't have to feel the pressure to break through a barrier if what you want to do is spend as much time with those two boys or, the, or your kids as you can for while you're raising them. I, I mean, I'm just, I'm, I'm, tr I'm not trying to put words in her mouth, but I'm going to mm -hmm. say that she may have um, some, an interesting perspective at this point of her life, and she may have felt very differently 20 years ago when she was, around 20 years old and in college and and now she this is her perspective at about 40 while she's you know while she's raising her kids so i'm gonna go with that i get i guess i'll go i guess i'll go with ugh, this like stings my, my tongue but i guess i'll go with good because you know as far as getting out there and starting things it does take a necessary level of whatever i have I'm going to put it out there. You know, it takes sort of that brazen, sort of unearned confidence that we all talked about. And I guess in her case, she has had a lot of success in her life. But I think a part of it is you just have to be big and bold enough to stay in the game and throw your hand on the table. And I think she definitely did that. And if she can be successful saying some of the super hyper-controversial things that she's saying, then I guess that's good for other people because anybody can, you know? Yeah. That's, oh, it hurts. It hurts, though. <laughs> it's an ouch. Uh, well, moving on to Whitney uh, Houston, um, you know, who's only lived to see 48 years old, right? Mm. Um, so, Marissa, what do you think? Good, bad, or indifferent? About her, meaning about, <laughs> not about her death, but about her life, and about how you feel about Whitney and how it went. The, as it said, I saw something today, the op her life was lived out like an opera. Oh, yeah. I, I, I guess that's really interesting. I mean, there's no doubt as the impact uh, that she had, you know, on music. And uh, um, I, I mean, I think she was amazing. I think she had a lot of issues and trouble. And, you know, so I, of, of course, I'm going to say that 
she was, you know, good for for our world and our society. And, you know, I mean, it's really, it's really terribly sad. And, uh, yeah, I don't know. <laughs> hey, I'm going to say her life was a good thing overall because, well, there's that special moment when you're a girl in middle school and you hear that I will always love you and to know <laughs> that there was that song out there was fantastic. Um, seriously, she was a great talent. I think it's very sad that towards the end, um, you know, she did, you know, sh- sh- with drugs and so forth, she did a lot of self-damage. But on the other hand, um, as I was reading today, she was actually a serious philanthropist, and she donated a lot of money and time to the Whitney Houston Foundation, which provides funding for kids with AIDS and cancer. So I I think it's sad that most people don't think of that when they think of her. But, Mm -hmm. you know, she was somebody who was a mother. She was a daughter. She was, you know, the heir to gospel music um i think she had a fabulous career and i I think what we should think of is sort of the bad years as as a footnote and instead focus on the good work that she did you know as 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 a amazing singer as an actress as a mother and as a philanthropist that's great holly i i have to say bad and here's why whitney you hurt me, man. You died early. You you put out this music that we'll never hear again. Like all of us who follow her, like I we you know I talked about this on another show actually earlier today. We call her like our own hot mess. Like you own Whitney if you're into music. And then, you know, it, yes, it's fun to watch her because her life's like an opera. But that just devastates me because her talent, what she had, the opportunity she was given. All of this other crap just tore all of that apart. And the fact that she's gone, that is bad. And it makes her, to me, like I feel like it's just connective of the whole. Bad, Whitney, because it's a tease. It's a constant tease of thinking you're going to get this great thing forever, or at least for the for a nice long life. And then you, we missed it for a while because she wasn't like quite there enough to like perform. So she just kept taking it away from us. And I think that's bad. <laughs> I wanted to have her full time. <laughs> oh. So an impassioned, sort of opposing bad. I'm cheating this week. I'm just cheating all the way down. <laughs> Why, that's true. Um, all right. Well, do we have any other women that we want, or do we want to kind of wrap up with our short topic? I guess we'll get into our chick news for this week. And I love the suggestion that Marissa made is maybe we'll talk about the Susan G. Komen Planned Parenthood issue, because I think that one's definitely very directly associated with Right, directly associated with what you're going to say with women and, and technology? or Well, women and Marissa was saying it has a huge tech technology association. I think it does have a huge tech association just because, you know, it was social media really, I think, that put mm-hmm. the majority of the pressure. I mean, yes, a lot of the Komen staffers, you know, either threatened to quit or quit, and I'm sure that had a huge impact on it too. But just seeing, you know, um, how quickly... Um, you know, the internets <laughs> were able to sort of band together and really fight this thing was pretty amazing. I mean, I think it's sort of the same phenomenon that happened with, uh, oh my God, I'm having a, a moment, the um, internet uh, piracy. Uh, oh, right. You know, it's that, it's that same just like massive um, wave of support or, you know, acknowledgement of a good organization and just, you know, pushing uh, the powers that be in the right direction. So I, I thought it was pretty fascinating to to watch and be a part of. So I thought that might be something interesting for us to talk about. Yeah, and Kate, you actually wrote a, bo- a blog about this that I'm looking at right now. Um, and I, I'm really interesting. I'm really interested in what you think about the way that you know social media definitely had a huge. I mean, you talk about that in your blog how how social media had a huge portion in making sure that Susan G. Komen knew that Planned Parenthood, especially th- for things like breast cancer screening, we're not talking about anything subversive here. You know, no. no um, what in a lot of the places that I read about it is that the the decision actually came down in the end of December. And it was basically just emailed to the to all people who received funding from Komen with not much explanation, but there was no public announcement made about it. It was when 
Planned Parenthood went out to say, by the way, we don't get funding from Komen anymore because um, this strange decision has been made. Um, that was when people started jumping out of the woodwork and saying, wait, what do you mean? And um, once you get it going on social media, if it's something that, you know, social media is a dangerous tool mm -hmm. in the tech world in that anybody can say something and all you need is one one right person to pick it up and that's a shot heard around the world and the idea that the rule was made to um, to disallow funding to anyone who is under any sort of federal local or state um, investigation was you know it later came out had been deliberately designed to um, not to defund Planned Parenthood to give them an excuse um, because there is a congressman in Florida who is saying, oh, I think federal, I want to just double check all the records, make sure no federal funding ever went to abortions at Planned Parenthood. And, you know, I've actually read that if that's true, there are some other fundings that should go away as well. One at um, a particular center for research at Duke, I believe it was, because they also have, you know, a, a local investigation. So it was sort of crummy. I felt if you're going to just defund them because, you know, somebody at the top really doesn't like that Planned Parenthood provides abortions, just say that. Mm -hmm. Honesty is huge in the media, and social media really magnifies that need for transparency because somebody will find something somewhere to, you know, if you're lying or obfuscating, someone's going to find the proof of that. And you know, in doing this, I think some of the most powerful reactions have been from people who actually, you know, benefited from the Komen Foundation, not necessarily through Prime Parenthood. There's a great video on YouTube that I watched. Um, you can search for it under the title, West, What Breast Cancer Is and Is Not. And it's a woman who has had a radical double mastectomy. And she had been a longtime supporter of the Komen Foundation, and she actually shows her scars in the video of where her breast used to be and says, you know what breast cancer is? It is not politics. There are no politics here on my chest. You know, funding is funding, you know. And just watching that, it makes you want to just sort of stand up and cheer. Here's someone who's really calling them out for what it is. And so by trying to use this back channel of announcing Oh, okay, by the way, we're going to defund you because of this rule we've just instated. But that's not going to work anymore. In the technology mm -hmm. world, there is the technology to find out what's going on and to amplify it incredibly. So, and then you're not just having your opponents amplify it. You're having everybody with an opinion amplify it. That's, you know, that's a great, I, I, I think that the fact that social media is, has so much power, you know, as we've said, in, in, when, when it comes to issues. And, and you know what's interesting is they get resolved, sort of things happen at a much faster pace as a result, don't you think? When something comes, an issue comes up and instead of the, the pace that it would have been at with just newspaper, TV news, and, and, or even cable news and kind of getting the word out and then people writing editorials about it into the newspaper on the, on the op-ed page and that kind of thing. This is just, it, it's instant. Uh, it is, it's very, I just find that that's such, it, it there's, there's no, uh, no doubt that politics will always, you know, has changed for, for forever because of that. Well, and I'd also like to point out that, um, and this is an issue that I have, uh, that my husband and I talk about because he works in cancer research, um, and this is going to be highly polarized, I'm afraid, but, you know, Komen actually does not give a, a very, they, they give a minuscule portion of it's their... It's 20, 20%. 20 ...to actual research, to actual cancer research. And whereas you have a company like Livestrong that picked up the slack on this, and they they support that uh, Komen also doesn't uh, support men who have breast cancer um, <laughs> because they they were created to support women, which which I appreciate. But I love that Livestrong picked up the slack on this because they were created under basically to say anybody who has cancer anywhere, man or woman, needs to be taken care of, and we want to give them support groups for whatever kind of cancer they have. We want to give all of the as much of the money as we possibly can to research. And 
I think it's sad that it, it sort of was hip there for a minute as like, you know, Lance Armstrong, everybody had the yellow bracelets, whereas uh, Komen has had a lot more staying power in the media because, you know, it was a, it was a one line, you know, it was a one it was one line at the bottom of, you know, the article about this, whereas like, you know, Komen has been everywhere in the news, you know, and all the good stuff that Livestrong has done has kind of fallen into the background over the years, and I think it's sad because I think they have picked up the slack that not just Coleman, but a lot of other cancer funding groups have, have let go, you know, and I just feel that they are, I, I think it's beautiful what they've done, and I'm so glad they stepped forward on this issue, you know, I think that's cool, and I don't think they get enough press for the kinds of stuff that they do, you know, anymore, after that initial everybody wearing a yellow bracelet and not really knowing why. People think of them as only being for prostate cancer, but it's not so. Mm -hmm. so. Well, and I think that that's a. I think that you made a great point that Komen is not is has its um, limits. You know what it wants to focus on, and we. I was just talking about this yesterday, actually, with some people, and I said, you know, I think that it's their right to. You know, they I mean, they founded this based on right. Susan Komen's sister founded it um, when she once she had died of breast cancer, and and in in her honor, right? So and. And, you know, they kind of, they, they can chart their own course, right, and give the money to where they want to. Um, although I guess what you're saying is because they have such a wide appeal that they, you just want them to be to be upfront about what they're supporting and what they're not. Yes, and that's what I think. I think uh, one of the things that I loved about Kate's article was it said, you know, transparency is really important in the Internet era because we're of a, we're of a generation that really will go out and, you know, not to use, not to coin the phrase, you know, like as, or not to use the phrase that's so popular, but, you know, we'll Google it. We'll find out what the truth is. It's out there somewhere and we'll search articles until we find it, you know, until we find the right source. And so it's important, especially in this day and age. I mean, you can get anybody's 1099. If you want to find out what your favorite company does with the money that you invest in them, you can get their you can get their annual reports online and find out exactly where all the money's going. And in this era of internet of you know internet everything within your fingers, you do have to be really transparent. And and it's important to make sure that people know what they're supporting. You know whether or not they agree with what you're doing is their own decision to make. You know. Mm -hmm. I agree. That sounds great. Thank you. Yeah. I don't, do you girls have anything you want to add to this week before we uh, before we check out? I wonder what would happen if social media had been there for Whitney Houston. Uh, <laughs> right. <laughs> Although you, I, I did actually read um, on LinkedIn today that um, social media broke the news of her death 27 minutes before the mainstream media, oh, which I should see. tell you what an amazing force it is in, uh, you know, that's where I actually turn to for news before I hit the New York Times page. Well, it's really funny because my husband came into the room and he was like, I think Whitney Houston died. And the first place I went to was not CNN. It was Twitter. Like, yes. It's, it's so interesting that that's, you know, where we, we go to now. Um, yeah. Well, that's a great idea for if you, if you ladies, if you chicks would like to come back, <laughs> are technically chicks, would like to come back and um, talk about maybe have a show about social media and just, you know, even a couple months down the road when there's even more to discuss because, of course, it's changing. At <laughs> oh, it's every evolving. minute. Every minute, right, every second. So thank you so much. This was really great. I, I love that it was technology, but also really we got into some hardcore stuff about girls and confidence and, and women and priorities and kind of I, I really enjoyed it very much. So thank you so much for being our guest this week. Thanks oh. for having us. Yeah, thanks for having us. Holly, you want to wrap us? Sure. <laughs> so that's uh, that's here at the Crashing Glass Podcast. And thanks to Marissa Levy Lair, we're breathing fire. So enjoy this song. I'm breathing fire. I'm bearing teeth and I'm cutting veins so I can make sure that you bleed.